Welcome everyone to today's webinar. I am Emma Goodman with Becker's Healthcare. We will begin today's webinar with a panel discussion and we will have time at the end of the hour for a question and answer session. You can submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled enter a question for staff and clicking send. We are looking forward to hearing your questions. We are pleased to have Scott Becker here, publisher of Becker's Healthcare, who will be leading today's panel discussion. And I'm thrilled to turn the floor over to him to begin today's webinar. Scott, to you. Emma, yeah, thank you so much. We're thrilled to have uh, Phillips helping us put this together today and just a magnificent couple presenters and sort of transforming your radiology service line for better care at lower cost. Uh, we've got two great leaders speaking today, and let me give you just a little bit of background as we get started. As the healthcare industry transitions to value-based care, hospitals and health systems are facing cost pressure while also trying to change their strategy and to innovate. These competing challenges cause many provider organizations to allocate technology investments to the areas with the greatest perceived need. This approach can create inefficiencies and result in disconnected systems in an environment that requires integration. Radiology is one of the key areas where many hospital leaders struggle to strike the right balance. While well, the need for imaging technology and radiology services has increased, reimbursements for these services have flattened or have declined. Many hospitals and health systems are using performance improvement tools and applying systems level analysis to reduce the financial risk associated with radiology services and enhance the value of these services. Today, we are fortunate to have with us two speakers who have a depth of experience in this area. First, we've got from Phoenix Children's Hospital, radiologist in chief, Richard Tobin, who's gonna share how his, his organization has created a master plan to innovate, connect, and continually improve its radiology service line, well driving clinical excellence and accelerating improved care delivery. Next, out of Green Bay, California, Mirren General Hospital, we've got Officer Mark Zilazinski, the Chief Information and Technology Integration Officer, will share how Mirren General has increased imaging volume and improved patient turnaround time by renovating its imaging technology and IT infrastructure with a strategic plan. Uh, Mark uh, and Richard, welcome to both of you. L let me start with, um, with this and we'll start getting into questions. Uh, Richard and Mark, can each of you give us a little bit of, of your background to help give the audience a sense of some of the issues you see? Richard? Sure. Good morning or afternoon, everybody. I'm in Pacific Coast time, so it's morning for me. Uh, my background uh, is is in medicine, of course, and I started life as a pediatrician and then trained as a radiologist and then fellowship in pediatric radiology and then morphed into pediatric neuroradiology and pediatric intervention because of the confluence of these developments in the late 70s. Um, and then I became, uh, when I started my training in Cincinnati and then uh, with, became vice chief in Children's of Michigan and then chief uh, of radiology in Pittsburgh, Philly, and now, and now in Phoenix. So I uh, sort of have been immersed in pediatric radiology for uh, four decades right now and, uh, and hopefully get an opportunity to express some of that learning to everybody as we go forward. Thank you. And Richard, how long have you been at Phoenix Children's Hospital now? A decade. A decade. Fantastic. Thank you. And Mark, some of your background as well, and then a little bit about your title, because I often see the title CIO, I see CTO, and you've got the, the joint title of Chief Information and Technology Integration Officer, which makes a ton of sense today, but maybe you could give us some of your background and explain that a little bit too. Sure. Uh, thanks. Thanks so much. Yeah, I, for me, uh, I've been in healthcare now about 40 years. Um, I have spent probably half of my time uh, as a, an administrator at a hospital with various titles. 
uh, and, and I'll explain the CITIO title in a minute. Um, and then the other half of my career I spent in um, consulting and service business for healthcare, uh, starting up a couple of companies and taking them public um, and doing some work on that side of the business. Um, in my hospital administration days, I've had responsibility like most CIOs you might think of, you know, with technology, IT, uh, biomedical engineering, communications, and those are all things I have responsibility for today. Um, but in addition, um, I have responsibility today for pharmacy, radiology, and lab, as well as the construction project and the integration of our multiple um, physician clinic organizations. We have about 35 different locations throughout the county, and that's how I got my title of CITIO, trying to pull all that together. Um, and we're in the midst of a, a very interesting time here. Um, Marin General is a uh, community hospital, 200-bed hospital, where we service uh, a fairly large geographic county, but a very sparsely populated county. And we are the trauma center for this county. So that's kind of my background. Um, I'm looking out the window and I see the steel for our new building, which I hope uh, to see us open in 2020. Oh, wow, fantastic. So 200 beds, 35 to 40 different sites, um, and, and, a, and a pretty diverse footprint in terms of the amount of area that you guys serve. So fantastic. Let me start with that, uh, Mark. The opportunities to utilize technology in a different way to reduce cost and improve patient experience. And then Richard, I'm really going to ask you the same question. So, so different ways in which you see to utilize technology to reduce cost, but improve patient experience. Yeah, so for us, it's been a, a very interesting time. Um, you know, we did this partnership with Philips about two years ago. And you know, when I got here, I've been at Marin General five years. When I got here, we had just uh, separated from the Sutter uh, Hospital Association here in Northern California. And we were left with an infrastructure that was in pretty sad shape. Um, and we needed to reinvigorate it. So a number of things we did and the reasons we looked for a partner like Philips was to clearly find um, the investment we needed to make that would allow us to get to that new hospital in 2020, but get us through the time from 2015 to 2020, which is when we started on this. And we looked at a variety of different technologies that um, I believe helped us cut costs. For example, um, we went, the very first thing we did was we went fully digital. We weren't fully digital uh, two years ago. And by going fully digital, we eliminated a number of different uh, cost elements from our organization. The other thing we did, uh, which is- Can, can I just important. stop you on one, one question on that, Mark? When you say sure. went fully digital, what does that mean exactly? I mean, what exact does that truly mean? No paper charts at all, no paper at all. What, how draconian a move was that? Well, for us, I, I mean digital in the in the imaging sense. We had uh, four imaging rooms that were not digital imaging rooms. We we're still processing film in one place on our organization, if you can believe that or not. Um, so we were. That was more about the film. We had been digital in terms of electronic charts um, since about 2012. So it wasn't that big of a deal on the EMR side, but it was a fairly significant investment to take our in the hospital rooms from a non-digital uh, diagnostic imaging environment to digital to replace a film-based room in one of our outlying uh, sites. And from, how great has that helped you? How much help has that been? To, to go completely digital on the imaging side? It's been, it's been a significant help for us. Um, our turnaround times are faster. We've gotten uh, much better um, patient throughput at our offsite outpatient clinic. Um, and, and our staff has, has been more satisfied and our cost structure has been reduced as a result. Gotcha. So overall, and it's made things simpler, better, just overall a huge positive move. And the, the last thing I would tell you that we did technologically is we, we just opened about four months ago our brand new breast center 
And there we went from the old 2D technology for uh, mammography to uh, 3D to uh, tomosynthesis. Uh, we added greater capacity and we did a number of things because we are the, the main site for um, uh, breast uh, care in the county, actually in a three county area. Um, so it was a big deal for us as well. And that's been a huge uh, patient satisfier uh, from what our old breast center looked like to what our new one is. Gotcha. And I want to come back to that in a moment. Richard, can I ask you, best opportunities to utilize, utilize technology in a different way to reduce costs and improve patient experience? What have you guys done that you're most pleased with, particularly, of course, in the imaging radiology side? Yeah, well, well, for us, first of all, you know, Phoenix is now the fifth largest city in the country, and we're the only children's hospital, freestanding children's hospital, completely uh, pediatric focus in the state. And we serve a broad area and, and includes parts of New Mexico and, and Nevada and all the way up toward uh, Colorado. So we have a big catchment area. So and, and just for, of, uh, for, a, for a moment, for people that are not familiar, Phoenix Children's Hospital is constantly ranked in the top 10, top 20 pediatric hospitals in the country, just a magnificent reputation, just to make sure people understand the credibility and the background from which you speak. Richard, go ahead, sorry about that. Yeah, well, well, that's all in the last decade, decade and a half, because it didn't start that way. So uh, we can get to that perhaps a different way. So, so, uh, so we have several ideas that operationally kind of connect somehow. So part of our way for controlling cost is one is we we have also of course a, a an enterprise relationship with Philips and that allows us to do some risk sharing and our relationship is over 15 years so that creates a shared risk environment and a very strong ability to control our future costs because we all have we have that worked out so our future is much more uh, specifically known than it's ever been in the past. So that's a huge piece of planning. Now, in terms of, of uh, our, our um, advantages that come from that, since we now have a state-of-the-art um, radiology department, and I mean it in the true sense, we're state-of-the-art uh, in, in anywhere, in the country, in the world probably at this point. And, and by us having the, this integrated imaging system, number one, is our repeat rate, our uh, use of protocol, and highly specialized uh, people, both in the radio, in the physician, but also technologists, nurses, and and administrators. So we're very tightly integrated, and so we drive our our imaging. We we try to get toward best of practice, which is a never ending battle. And we we run things as much as possible on protocols, and so this allows us to do process improvement, at which then gets to quality and to the economics of it. And then we work when possible, and this is a challenge always. We work with the other specialties to hone down on what the the imaging, the best imaging for the question is so over time we keep continually try to do more with with less so faster throughput more specialty direction and uh and then we have all of these uh, uh, assistance modes that that we can do because we have some state of the art but we're also working with a lot of first of kind so so we mix these things to the best we can to to both give us an advantage in the marketplace and a destination. So we work on revenue side, and then the impact of cutting costs is even better because we drive both revenue, and we then try to, from an incremental basis, decrease costs over the over the, our big practice. So sort of a lot of ideas in there, but that's sort of our general summary. No, thank you very much. Let me, let me ask you a follow-up question to that, Dr. Taubin, is um, prioritizing technology investments and sort of looking at them short and long term. You had mentioned that you set yourself up well for the future with your technology investments. Could you 
Could you tell us a little bit about how you decide where you're going to spend money on technology-wise as it relates to radiology service line and imaging and so forth? Well, well, for us, the, the one of our main goals is market differentiation and destination development of a destination. You don't do that by cost cutting. That's not that's not what's in that in that bailiwick. You do that by by state of the art and and uh, medical developments, which is tends to be more revenue generating than expense cutting. So so we have to balance it because what we want to be model wise is what I call a, a hybrid academic private practice model, which is a model that I've in, been interested in on a personal basis and we're trying to understand better because it, I've come from an academic back uh, hospital background, but that tends to be arrogant and not focused on service delivery. It's focused on on uh, first of kind or new new concepts. Here, we're trying to take the best of both worlds, which I think is much more practical because patient service is, and customer friendly uh, site is really quite critical to our local success. And so balancing that with state of the art and cutting edge that if I if we can get that right, it should it should propel us in a positive way in the marketplace and in the academic world. So it gets us both both goals. And it's sort of a fascinating concept that it, it, it's not so much focused on cost cutting; it's focused on being the best, being great, but being smart about it. Is what I hear you saying. It's, so it's not really a, it's not really a, a, um, a an approach of um, a hammer. It, it's a much more thoughtful approach of no, we're not just trying to cut costs as much as possible. We're trying to be smart and be great. Is is really right. what I hear you if, saying. If you if you cut costs, you're going to not become a you're going to be a provider, but not a market leader, and so you're going to be one of many places, and you're you're going to find your at least from my perspective you have fewer choices uh, of how to do what you what you want to do our choice is to be is to drive excellence and and innovation and then manage cost the best we can without choking innovation so keeping keeping that balance right it, and that's of course easier said than done it, and, and Mark, some of your thoughts on the same question: How do you weigh technology investments? You know, how do you prioritize? I know that there's within any system, there's a constant request for all kinds of things, and increasingly the CIO, CTO, persons integrating all that is stuck with the issue of how do I tell people yes and no, and prioritize what gets done now versus later. Well, it's it's interesting, and Dr. Coleman kind of hit on a few things. First of all, you know, it's not a focus solely on taking out cost. Cost should come out of the equation if you are being efficient, making sure you're deploying your technology in such a way that it's it's uh, complementary to one another, instead of having different technologies that are on islands or that are non-connected or non-synergistic and allowing your staff to become fluent and able to use different types of technology and doing the things you can do to become efficient. And you know, part of our um, relationship and the reason we did the relationship with Phillips was that um, you know, we, we couldn't have fixed the things that we had in place um, and that we're fixing today at the same time we were building a new building because all of our resources were focused on getting to the new building yet we had all these needs that we had to get accomplished. And so we not only looked at ways to get that technology in, but we also, and Phillips is a big player with us on this, looked at ways to build in efficiencies. So for example, one of the big things we're doing now is figuring out the best utilization for our interventional suites that exist today and will, will be replaced in the future but not trying to spend any more money today um, just by doing better utilization and better scheduling and doing those things and having a team approach for how we use those suites because four different service lines are using those are using those suites. And so that's what we're focused on doing. That's how we're getting cost out. We didn't go in 
with cost as the main thing. We went in with how do we best utilize our resources and how do we have an ongoing plan? Let, let, let me ask you a question on, um, and, and you said something fascinating, which is not so much the absolute cutting of costs, but making sure we're not spending any more than we have to today and to make sure we're much more efficient. Just a moment on the relationship and evolution with Phillips and how you chose Phillips and how you ended up in that spot. And I don't, I don't want this to be a commercial, but I would like to understand it because you've mentioned it a couple times. Sure. I mean, for us, it was uh, about three or four years ago when we start. When you, so, so a little bit, I, I'll do this as quickly as I can in terms of background. We had a plan to build a new building. And we knew that that building was going to cost us about $700 million. We're a tax-based organization, and the, the, uh, the population here had, had agreed to a, an additional tax that would have funded about a little bit more than half of that. So we had to fund the other half of that new building. Um, and when we looked at it, we knew here were all the things we wanted to do in that new building, but there was a bunch of work we had to do in our current place to get us there because we're not going to open until 2020. And in, in diagnostic imaging in particular, we had underinvested for many years. So what we set out to do back in, I believe it was, we started in 2013, we set out to talk to the three big players out there, Phillips, GE, and Siemens, and say, look, if this is what we want to accomplish by 2020, how do we build a relationship with you that gets us from where we stand today to where we want to be in 2020? And so we worked with all of those players. And, and the program that Phillips brought to us was more about strategic planning and looking at, and they asked us hard questions about what our volume, what our growth uh, uh, was for the community, where did we see our needs at, and we started to build a 15 year plan that modeled that growth structure. Um, and so in, in essence, what we did is we built this relationship and what's come out of it is not only is it a way to get access to technology, i.e. pieces of equipment, but we're also working with them to build our cadre of lean uh, folks in our organization. In the past year, we've, done lean training with Phillips for about um, 45 different staff members throughout our organization. Mark, we, thank you. Let me do this, just because I want to make sure we hit a lot of the agenda we have today. But that's extremely helpful in understanding the context. You went through a process, you really looked at three different main vendors in the radiology services area, and you really ended up with a partnership with Phillips because it just fit a lot of the actual needs. It was very custom developed to what you guys needed. It sounds like so far, fantastic. Let, let me do a follow-up question. The move to value-based care and the in how that influences decisions that you're making from the business and clinical side. Mark, you from the business side and Dr. Tobin, you from the clinical side, just a couple perspectives on how the changes in value-based care are influencing decisions. Who do you want to start, Scott? Richard, why don't you start, and then we'll go back to Mark on the business side, because I, I was just with Mark a moment ago. So, Richard, why don't you give us a little bit on the clinical, and we'll, then we'll rally back to Mark. Well, well, for us, the you know, again, value-based care is is sort of the the balance we're trying to achieve, and uh, you've already heard my preference, which is growth. Uh, because that, if I can if I can grow and and maintain or decrease costs, then the, the delta gets better and better, and uh, and we end up with higher end and more market differentiation. So for us, the, the strategy is is focused on, on that. So and to give you an example, in the in the in the ten years that that we're t that I've been here, our our radiology department's gone from a, a, a gross of about 75 million to 150 million is growing the MD staff from five to 20 something, zero fellows to five. And we grow in IR, for example, we did last year, we did almost 3,500 patients, 4,000 4, and change procedures and 8,000, almost 8,500 CPT codes. And so we're doing 
So we add that we're adding value, and if we go, and if I went across every single line of of business, we're adding value because we keep driving new services. So we're in the odd position that radiology is driving volume into the hospital as well as the being a downstream uh, player as we typically are. So so if you go look across our board, we have innovative stuff with new programs in radiography with radiography, ultrasound, CT, MR, angio, including development of a 3D lab that's now generating positive revenue in its second year. So, and, and so you're trying to, as, as, I, as I summarize, you're really trying to get better and better and be a lead generator for the hospital in terms of growth, not just a downstream user of services, but also right. a, you know, a, a growth engine and really putting resources into developing a, you know, a first level, top level radiology services department. Right, because if you if you go look at the number side for the for the audience, I mean we we as radiologists contribute about as in the range of fifteen percent of the of the revenue to the entire hospital. So so by doing that and all the things that we're now involved in discussion, the in terms of making decisions of where to put where to put investment, we become a big. Uh, uh, ROI generator, so it makes the decision easier, and then we become in the lead for other program development. So, for example, we've just done laser-assisted brain surgery through through MRI, and that program gets here because we're strong. We're an anchor service for the entire hospital. So it leads to backwards, but it leads to making more strategic investments outside of radiology by having this platform. So it's, 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 the, concept, it's the, 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 the concept is radiology is one of the most important revenue areas for hospitals. And rather than ignore it or devalue it, it, it's really taking the opposite position, even in a value-based care world, is to continue to build on it as a strength of your health system. Uh, and then there's so many different benefits that come from that. Yeah, that's been the experience, Scott, yes. And Mark, let me turn it to you. The move to value-based care influence, and, and how does that influence the decisions you're making at, at Marin General? So, so I look at it in, in some ways similarly to Dr. Tobin, but for for us, there are two issues, right? One is, as we look at what uh, value-based um, care is about, we've had to do some things with our physicians, for example, in our orthopedics areas to make sure that we have the right technologies available so that it gets delivered according to the plan that the physicians work with. So we, we're partnering with our physicians to make sure we're delivering the right stuff at the right time all, all along the care time. So not only uh, prior to their orthopedic procedure, during their hospital stay and afterwards, we need to have everything at the right time so we don't repeat studies, we don't do things like that number one and then number two we have to have the right stuff so we're the place you go because we i described us as you know being in a, in a county north of the city of san francisco it's a very big county geographically but we only have three hundred and seventy-five thousand people in the county so that's our service area and the north of us but we have to have everything here so that people won't go into the city to get it and so, for example, that means for us, when we built our breast center, we needed to make it a place that everyone in this county will come for their breast health. When we build our uh, new imaging center and the new facility, we want to make sure that folks come here for their uh, MRIs and 3T MRIs here. So those are the things we need to do. So it's a combination of two different avenues, I believe, that have come out of this one is to work more closely with our physicians to manage the care that we get paid for based on that value-based proposition and the other is to make sure we're the place folks will think to go first and and have the technology and resources here to do that got you thank you very much next question relates to patient choice and consumerism you've got patients that are paying a lot more of their of their 
payments out of pocket, higher deductibles, higher coinsurance, and in some ways, a, a more empowered patient. And in the radiology area, more and more advertising to try and make radiology a little bit more commoditized, uh, which for those that are in the business of doing the best care, often trying to avoid that commoditization. How do you deliver integrated care? How do you, uh, Mark, let me start with you on this issue of patients paying out of pocket, and is it leading to changes, and how do you then deliver integrated care in that context? Well, it, it's very interesting. Uh, in particular, there's, I, I would say, on, on hospital-based resources, you know, recently Anthem came out looking at reducing um, and, and redirecting um, patients away from hospital-based resources. And so for us, one of the things we have to be prepared for is to have a, a delivery mechanism that allows us to compete um, and not lose that business. Um, people are going to be directed to the, those areas where there's a low cost um, for them and where they're going to pay less out of pocket. It's, that's where the, uh, the uh, insurance industry is absolutely headed. What that means for us is we're going to have to be very flexible with how we design our outpatient and ambulatory strategies so that we can compete. The good news is that we're a, a fairly big player in our space, but our space is, as I said, pretty small. So we've got we've got a bigger um, community that we're we're going to have to deal with. Uh, one of the you know ways we can do that is drive our cost structure down so that again you know our patients will come here and their out of pocket costs will be less, and insurers will not look at us as a high cost provider and it's something we're gonna to have to work with. We're gonna to have to, I believe it'll be, um, and we're, we're just getting ready to start negotiations with two of the payers. And so that's gonna be a big part of our future, negotiating with payers and figuring out how we manage our imaging services because they're gonna increasingly come under scrutiny by the payers. Gotcha. And trying to avoid, right, the Anthem type thing and where they tried to stop paying people for hospital-based care, at least the hospital-based rates yep. for certain outpatient services, and then also trying to avoid being out of network where your patients get dinged with larger unexpected bills. And so more and more trying to negotiate that up front with payers and with your community. Um, Dr. Tobin, any thoughts on um, either delivery of integrated care and then the follow-up question, the most growth in your practice from new technology? You mentioned a number of them. Um, first, any comments on integrated care? Then I'd love to hear your thoughts on the three newest technologies or technologies that you're making the most use of in the radiology area. Yeah, well, the, the first part is that w here's, the, so this is the biggest challenge of the day, and it precedes the chaos that's been created by and disruption of the market that's being pushed by Anthem, and uh, that, that'll be curious with the outcome there, but there'll be a lot of litigation that follows. But the, the, the other part of it is, though, that there are rules and regulations that differentiate outpatient imaging from hospital-based imaging, and based its, its copay and facility fees. And, and those things are problematic, and in order to create a single a single bill that includes pro fee, professional fee, and technical fee, you have to follow rules uh, for, for that payment. And so most systems are now looking for those opportunities because they do want to compete with the outpatient imaging uh, providers because generally speaking, they're, they're, vo they're high volume, lower quality solutions. So again, a state of the art, high quality solution, if they're cost competitive, should win that battle provided convenience is reasonable. So so I think that's a work in a definite work in progress, but the strategies and outcomes are developing and, and that includes our particular hospital. Uh, and at the same time, we're looking at now the second part of your question, which is differentiation uh, and and driving volume and revenue by by the modality. So 
I'll give you a, I'll give you a, an example or two across the board. So on in the in the field of digital plane film, digital radiography, one of the differentiators, and we have is is so-called EOS, and that is a cone beam, a vertical cone beam CT for for scoliosis for back for back studying the spine, long bones, uh, and that. We're the only, we have the only unit in all of Arizona, so so we're gonna we're seeing adults and children coming to us. Ultrasound, we're doing special things, including elastography, which heart measures hardness and contrast. Again, differentiating and bringing us new markets uh, because of the, that technology. Also, there's navigation in that, so we can do more cost-effective, faster interventions. CT, we have we just installed the first unit in the, the first clinical unit in the United States uh, called Spectral CT, and ours is called Icon I Q O N, and and again that that looks at things with two different energies and is giving us a unique opportunity for development in there. We also run unique services, fetal imaging, cardiac imaging, and then we have because of our uh, research type of relationship. We're the only one in the country that does spiral reconstruction to faster throughput reconstruction for MR, which is one of our big, MR and IR are the biggest re uh, reimbursers in terms of dollars per unit study. So plain film, I'll give you, let me a a end with this, Scott. The plain films generally do about 80, con uh, consist of about 80% of our total volume intervention and and neuro uh 20 percent but the but the neuro and intervention drives 40 percent of the revenue so so we we're we focus to the extent possible on those higher revenue generators because and they also add of course more complexity so if we differentiate on that it's more likely than someone coming in for a chest x-ray and pass a a dock in a box to do that, even though our skill set's better. So, gotcha. So, so just just to, just to summarize back, Doctor Hillman, because I think it's a fascinating point. Is twenty percent of the volume comes from interventional sort of neuro, but forty percent of the revenues come from it, and I assume it's also similarly positive from a profit margin perspective. And so, right. it, it, in terms of the things of that have the the growth of the less commodity stuff to to overstate or simplify it has been the biggest driver of better return on investment. Reasonable. Yes. Great. Okay. Okay. That No, that's very, very helpful. Um, and, and Mark, any thoughts on where you see the most growth in the practices from new technology? Yeah. I, um, I, 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 I would echo exactly what Dr. Tobin is saying is true for us. And, and we are building our interventional uh, capacity. Um, we will build that in our new building. Um, and and you know, the other area for us is to some of the some of the stuff related to cancer uh, and work there. Uh, we we hope to have a three team magnet in because that just just like the interventional, the uh, MRI is also another source of revenue and profit for us. And we hope to have one of those in within the year as well. Those are the areas that that I think we'll see uh, improvements in from bringing new technology. And it's stuff that once we get in place, I think we can use better to serve our community um, and the community north of us. Gotcha. Thank you. Very, very. Go ahead. That MR brings in at least three times more volume and profession and technical dollars is where it's at, not pro dollars, but technical dollars. It's usually 15, 60 per, 15 to 16 percent of the total 20 percent is is neuro so so definitely if you're going to focus on one thing focus neuro gotcha fascinating and, and let me keep on going with a couple other questions we've got on challenges of standardization or commoditization versus specialization and, and how hospitals have to work to prioritize it and operational investments as well and mark let me start with you here you know, you've got the situation, and it's one of the huge growth areas and challenges for everybody is clinical service lines have moved up the, the totem pole in terms of what they're asking for in terms of new tools, technology, apps, and so forth. 
and and how do you prioritize all the different requests that you get? I mean, at one time, a lot of the requests we went back a decade ago came out of the CIO's office or, or top leadership office, and it was maybe driven towards original big EHR investments and so forth and so on. Now it seems as though the spend and the request are coming from a myriad number of places and many of them clinical service lines. How do you prioritize who gets what and where do you invest money and time? Yes, yeah, so, so this is an, an incredibly important for us because we're, we're you know, relatively, well, I would say small to medium-sized organization and, and, and our spend is real important to us and leveraging it to the best way possible. And, and what I would tell you that we have, uh, we have really pushed for as as we've done design and and the new building and for the things we're doing in our existing structures utilize resources as much as possible in a in a non-specialized way and by that i mean for example um, we had an ep lab that we basically only did electrophysiological stuff in we only did ep studies in up until three years ago, which meant that that EP lab, which we only have one physician for, stood empty and unused 70% of the time. We can't afford as an organization to specialize at that rate and spend that kind of money. So what we've done with our new interventional lab, what we did with that EP lab, we updated it, we made it something that can be used by multiple service lines we put the, the rooms together in such a way that they aren't as specialized any longer. And when we look at um, requests, we look at things that we can find ways to use pieces of technology and investment in such a way that we can leverage it and get the highest level utilization out of that investment. And it's something that, uh, that's a, a key part, quite frankly, without this being a, a um, a commercial for, but it's a key part of our Philips relationship, understanding how we can make investments that serve multiple or dual, uh, at, at a minimum, dual functions. And when we have to specialize, specialize in such a way that we do just what we need in order to meet the need in our community and not have dollars sit in an investment that's underutilized. And it's critical for us as an organization. And you're right. The demands have been huge from a, a variety of different places. And one of the things we did as a result of our relationship is we built a governance structure that looks at all those requests. And we're in the process of putting together something that we call an enterprise project management organization, which will report to my peers and I uh, at the executive level and manage those requests for any type of technology throughout the organization so that we focus on those that have the greatest um, uh, that, that meet the greatest need in the community and have the ability to be standardized so we can utilize multiple different specialties with them and that, right that's you're, you're trying to avoid it a, a, a great point you made at the start of your discussion was the electrophysiology is, is trying to make sure that not just one person's using it 20 percent of the time that if you're right. going to invest in something and buy something it's being used by at least some group of people or at least places where there's real value in it. And that's always a tough choice internally as to how you sort of manage that and deal with the personalities of it as well as the economics of it. And, and Dr. Tobin, let me ask you the same question. Um, you know, where do you see this issue in the radiology clinical area in terms of uh, your point of view? Um, is to how you choose to invest, where you choose to invest, and how do you manage that? Yeah, we're on. We're. I don't envy Mark's job. I I think that's terribly difficult because you're mostly managing cost, and so it, it's 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 hard to de to specialize and differentiate on specialty, going that way. Fortunately, uh, and that's not what I'm good at. And so, for, for us, it's the other side of it. We drive innovation, and that drives uh, many other things. So so our our control our control of, of the cost and the selection of what's best we we make uh, in a collaborative way with our partner and uh, and and we're always driving for 
the 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 first of kind because as an early as an early adopter or an innovator, we get more a bigger piece of a small pie uh, because the CPT codes the way it gets developed. If you're early, you get bigger fees than if you're late. So so our focus is completely different. But then with that, but I, the part w that we agree on is is the worst thing to do is to buy technology that that you can't use. And in our world, the example would be, for example, uh, an intraoperative MR. So it's behind the red line. And so uh, what I mean by that is it's in a sterile area. So you, so you have to dress specifically to get there. So if you have an MR, you'll do in a in a busy place, you'll do a hundred or two exam, and it and it's very hard to maintain high expense, low utilization problem. Uh, and there are many other pet MR is another one where there's not good reimbursement structures, and so the and the the, the investment is six to eight or more million dollars. So we have other ways of doing that. So we are differentiate on things that that are so early that have no reimbursement uh, and we can't fund it. Um, and so we have to, if we're going to get that, we have to get it without clinical revenue and look at different ways. So our focus though, as a general statement is drive revenue, manage down expense and, and try to find the sweet spot of the variable profit that we can. Uh, and, and that's the way we we've done it with, with, because we're in a growth area and we're big. Great, and I think both of you. I thank you because both of you us gave us gave us some uh, very specific examples of things that you'd be careful on investing in. Uh, one concept, something that's only used intraoperatively, so it doesn't have other uses, which you might still have to invest. In. You might have no choice, but it wouldn't be your first choice as a place to invest. And and then the example of you know just to have one physician user, user and you, if you invest in a lot of technology there, and sometimes you have no choice with that, you're sort of held hostage to that situation. Uh, so, so you know, and a lot of other great thoughts wrapped into that as well. But a couple of things I took away right away that I thought were fascinating. I'm going to ask you each a question, a number of questions to conclude our webinar today. We've got about 10 minutes left. And Mark and Dr. Tobin, question to Mark, I'll start with you. Where do you see the greatest opportunity for transformation of your system? And you're going through a transformative arena as it is, as you build a new hospital, brought in a new system on the radiology imaging side. Where do you see the greatest opportunity for transformation? And then Richard will ask you a similar question because you've had this fascinating transformation of, as I've watched Phoenix Children's become one of the most elite children's hospitals in the country over the course of the last decade or so. So, so Mark, the biggest opportunities for transformation and then Richard, the same question for you. Wow. So, uh, I mean, for us, uh, and, and this, this is where I have to put my non-technology administrator hat on, because I think the biggest area for us to transform our organization, you know, we're, we're a California-based hospital, which means our physicians are not cannot be uh, part of our organization. They're a separate entity. And so we have a, a huge um, row ahead of us that we need to we need to partner with them it's my you know the, yeah, that technology integration part of my hat that i wear trying to get 35 some odd clinics all together and in, in talking and understanding the technology we are putting together um and to that end uh, the biggest thing we're going to do is we will i said we're a, a community hospital the biggest thing we're going to do is not only work with our physicians to get them aligned but we are going to do some type of very large scale affiliation uh, kind of arrangement. And that'll be the big transformation for us uh, because it'll allow us to do some of the things we just can't do today in terms of extending our uh, ambulatory footprint to the north right now. And that, when you ask, and so that's, uh, that's the key thing. If, if I wanted to bring it home to what's happening as it relates to imaging for the audience we have here today, I think the key things around imaging for us are um, to build these new um, interventional suites and to bring in the technology in the new building. And to that extent, we're working with Philips uh, to that extent right now. We will be acquiring uh, devices in the next 18 months as the building goes up. So we're looking right now at 
what are going to be those pieces of equipment? What are they actually going to look like? What technologies can we get our hands on right now that will allow us to have the, the greatest uh, impact for the longest period of time in that building? And, and those, those are the things that are happening for us as an organization. So f fascinating, really two big points on transformation. One is the, the concept that you might not be able as a system to really stay independent for the long run, figure out what that alliance might look like. And second, on a more micro level or operational level is, as you open up this new hospital, as you develop new systems, what you know, are you really going to put in? What is, are you and Phillips together going to figure out how to put in and make work and use? And so sort of two a macro transformative event and then a micro one, but both critically important. One critical for the next few years and one maybe critical for the next 50 years. But yeah. so, so fascinating. And Richard, the greatest opportunities for transformation in your system, what do you see there? And then well, to bring I, it home to the radiology area too is great. Yeah, I've got a, a several things I, I'll just kind of overview and then we could, if we have a couple of minutes, we'll go into them. Well, for me, it's it's a combination of more subspecialization and bringing this subspecialization so it's easily available to the community at large, close to us or not so close to us. So in terms of the more subspecialization, I'm, I recently added more a, a person who has uh, it adds to our expertise and fetal imaging, which is a big growing area. And also as a, oddly, he's a pediatric radiologist, but started life as an obstetrician gynecologist. So we're gonna branch out into some women's imaging, because he's the go-to guy in the city right now. We're adding neurointervention to a very active and big interventional area. And that's gonna create destination programs for us in a couple of disease entities like retinoblastoma, brain brain AVMs and so on. And then on, on the comp competition of bringing our services to the community, we're gonna focus on single billing outpatient imaging so we could compete with the lesser skilled, in our opinion, uh, dock in the boxes or, or uh, imaging centers. One of our unexpected growing areas are adults with congenital diseases. So for example, there are more adults today with congenital heart disease alive than children, which is a tremendous transformation over time. And so the adult centers are very uncomfortable with this, don't know those diseases, and we have challenges because of the comorbidity. So adults with congenital is a story that's gonna be ongoing. And last, uh, one of the things that we're great at and as radiologists uh, and have had decades of experience is teleradiology, telemedicine. And so as a strategy to do more outpatient imaging and touch more people uh, with high expert, with providing them high expertise differentiation and efficiency in diagnostics, we're, we want to offer more and more teleimaging services uh, around our state. And we're doing that by developing more satellites and and some small mini hospitals scattered throughout the our, our service area. So a lot of a lot of territory in that little five or six piece, but that's sort of the essence of it. Let me do this. I know almost our entire audience has stayed on for the entire call. I'd like to go to about five minutes after the hour, if it's okay, Mark and Richard, with you, and and work through a couple of the audience questions as well at this point. Is that okay with, with you two? And then we'll hit some of these audience yeah. questions. As okay. Long as people want to talk. Yeah. yeah. Great. One of you mentioned that multiple different service lines are working out of your interventional radiology suite. You mentioned three or four different areas. Richard, I think this is you. It, it, can you give us some specifics on that? Well, Actually, in, I, I, in intervention, we, it's only intervention. There are only interventional radiologists, but our interventional radiology group does soup to nuts, does head to toe uh, in in uh, all ways. So um, there are no other physician subspecialties that routinely work there. But we do some. We do work with physicians in that space, and they do their. So we do combined studies like. Uh, 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 endoscopy and or laparoscopic procedures that have interventional components. So we do we do that, but it's a single area. Very very busy. Does twenty something exams a day, procedures a day in that place. So busy. Gotcha. Mark, a question for you is the Anthem decision outpatient imaging. 
do have a sense of how that will impact business, and do you expect to have a domino effect with other payers? I, I, we we are working uh, uh, with um, Anthem. We're working with um, two other payers right now where we're trying to get contracts uh, put together. We're in negotiations for contracts. I think it, it has a significant impact. Um, I you know for us, for example, we're the only uh, there is there are no other non-hospital based CTs in the county of Marin right now. So um, if they're going to do what they expect they want to do, then those folks would have to go into the city to get CTs done, and I, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, but I think it's, it, it's, uh, it tells us where the payers are going and it tells us what's going to happen over the next two or three years as, you know, there will be more and more scrutiny put on different diagnostic imaging uh, procedures, uh, particularly hospital-based ones. Um, and, 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 and I think that's, that's the point that I seem to hear a lot is it's not having a huge current impact on people's revenues, but people are quite concerned about over the next two to five years and where right. it may be directionally. Yeah. Now, let me ask you a follow-up question, Richard. Maybe this is aimed better at you to start with. It's the loss of volume in imaging uh, where GI physicians have their own labs, cardiologists have their own labs. Are you looking at what's the strategy to minimize that loss of volume is it to just become so good at what you do at Phoenix Children's that people are drawn to you or are you doing separate relationships and partnerships or trying to evolve the service better those areas? How do you offset some of that movement? You know, in, in the old days, those ortho, orthopods trying to do their own MRI. How are you fighting or strategizing with respect to some of the imaging going out to individual types of specialties? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question, and it certainly has, you could discuss this issue for a while. But I think one of the, the things that, uh, that the question focuses on is the adult radiology versus subspecialty clinical market. It, and it's different in adults and pediatrics. So we see very little of it, mostly cardiologists doing cardiac MR, um, but we don't see gastroenterologists, uh, orthopedists, et cetera, et cetera, doing any imaging, unless they're, uh, the competition for that stuff is coming from the imaging centers and not from uh, internal. So uh, the only thing we can do is, is compete on cost and convenience and provide a better product. And it's a balance, right? You, and uh, people still go toward convenience and the, the community of uh, customers the, the patients don't are not very sophisticated in understanding the skill set differentiation piece of doctors particularly radiologists because they don't really know what they do or who they are gotcha one other uh question we've got a, a, a couple other questions and, and mark without um you know you've mentioned the Phil's partnership a lot and, and at least a few times and any thoughts on how you go about the process of choosing a venture, a vendor for this sort of overall transformation and how you handled imaging services? You know, how how much of an RFP did you use? How did you go about this? A few thoughts on that for people. Yeah, sure. We we spent, as I said, we spent about two years. We didn't do a formal detailed RFP. We did an RFI at the beginning. Um, I think the number one thing you have to do um, is you have to get your organization in place and you have to build both an internal governance structure for how you're going to make the decision. And then once you've found a partner, and that was a key part of uh, putting our relationship together, is making sure that there was an ongoing governance structure that managed the risk sharing, that managed the, uh, the other parts of the agreement, like the education components and so forth, that structure is critically important and you have to be married to it and you have both, both parties have to put into that. Um, in our current relationship, we have quarterly um, meetings that happen on a, what we call the joint operating committee level, which is myself, uh, the chief medical officer and our chief financial officer are engaged in. 
Um, we're engaged in it on a regular basis. We look at uh, are we achieving our targets or not. Um, it's critically important. And I'm to be honest, to, to give you a sense, I'm doing the same thing right now in our clinical laboratory. We're looking at, I just sent out the RFI to nine uh, participants. We're going to go through that process. And hopefully by the end of the year, next year, we'll have a similar relationship in the clinical lab space where we'll look at automating our, our laboratory environment. I can't, I can't say enough about how important it is because it does manage your cost. It makes sure you have a plan for investment, particularly an organization our size where um, when the demands on capital get really tight, you just start putting stuff off. And that's how we ended up having the diagnostic imaging infrastructure we had four years ago. It had been neglected for probably a decade. Um, let me do, go ahead, Richard, go ahead. And then, then I'm going to ramp up this because lose people. Yeah. Richard, thank you. I was briefly going to say that you got to be careful. This is a slippery slope. And, uh, and what I mean by it is there are only a few companies out there that are, that are very, very good to excellent across the imaging spectrum. And, and in my view, they're Phillips and Siemens. And, uh, obviously I prefer Phillips, but, uh, but the other companies don't really aren't really excellent and and invest in their in up keep maintaining and upgrading their fleet of imaging services. So you got to start out with reality again. Do your due diligence. But the reality is, can the company do what they say they're going to do? Oh, because this is a long relationship. So if they fall off the the map and they're not good in quality, then then the whole thing falls apart. So. So you have to be careful. And in our case, the relationship was a, a nine or 10 year relationship. Well, actually longer because it predated me in Phoenix. And we designed, developed it in radiology. And then later on, we grew to an enterprise level with, uh, with monitors and IT. And so now we have a broader relationship, but initially it was driven out of radiology because that's, and because that's the strategy that we employed and it, and it grew and worked and prospered over time. So we had a long audition period, but it's important that somebody that knows imaging and quality of imaging goes with the, is a member of the team that analyzes it, which is just not about money only. You could make a really bad mistake here. What it's, and it sounds like both of you have made the decision that you've got to be with the best in class if you want to make sure this is going to work for the long run. So you can't just look at it as a cost saving thing. You've actually got to be with the best in class and then hope that that's right. the most economic and efficient, no. too, in the long run. But it's it just a great um, – well, let me do this. I want to thank you, Richard and Mark. Just magnificent participants and just extremely informative on a whole range of subjects to give you know people a real sense of the issues you're facing today and how you're trying to judge these issues of investment versus increasing value, well, not increasing cost. And what I love some of the things Richard you said about still trying to be value-based care environment, yes, but we're actually trying to be the best as well. We're not just trying to be value-based care, we're trying to be be great. And Mark, some of the thoughts you had about how you manage your thoughts on choices and the reality of, you know, it's not unlimited dollars, but we have to be great too. So yeah. just just a great um, chance to visit with both of you from Marin General and Phoenix Children's. And I'm it, it, immensely thankful to Phillips Healthcare for putting this on, for sponsoring today, who's our sponsor. Um, you know, and, and I'm pleased that, uh, you know, it, what a great leader in the space Phillips Healthcare is and that they allowed us to do the webinar with very little talk about Phillips itself and really about the technology and cost issues that you guys face uh, in, in a changing world in healthcare. So, Richard, Mark, I'm going to sign off and I appreciate your guys' time greatly. Thank you both very, very much.